question for you. How many of you here, and now if you don't want to answer this question, you can keep your hands down because I understand. How many of you think that the New Testament, as a majority of the books, were originally written in Greek? Either nobody or nobody wants to raise their hand. Okay, we do have one, two, there's, there's a few, three. Oh, used to. Okay. How many of us used to think that the New Testament was written? Virtually everybody. How many of you think that the majority of the New Testament was originally written in Aramaic? Okay, maybe 10%. How many think it was in Hebrew? Okay, probably about 50%. Why? Why do you believe that? Is that wishful thinking? Do you have evidence of that? Do you, can you, if somebody, you were getting into a discussion with somebody, could you defend your belief that the majority of the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew? How many of you could? Ten, twelve. Okay, a few of you. That's good. What I want to do is present to you some material, just the tip of the iceberg here, on the Semitic origins of the New Testament. And I say Semitic because there are some that could have been written in Aramaic, but I personally believe that the majority of them were originally written in Hebrew for several reasons, and I'm going to present that material here. An overview of what we're going to be going through. Archaeological evidence. What have we discovered over the last hundred years? Biblical archaeology is only about a hundred years old. It's a fairly recent form of archaeology. Actually, archaeology in a whole, as a whole is fairly recent. It used to be you just found something neat and threw it away. You didn't care. We've now recognized that we need to preserve these things. Biblical archaeology is about 100 years old. And there's a lot of people that are going to the land of Israel and finding a lot of things. We looked at some examples uh, yesterday or the day before. We'll take a look at historical evidence. What does history itself tell us about the, the writings of the New Testament? Manuscript evidence, textual evidence, is what is the, the textual evidence of the Bible itself? The New Testament itself, does it contain any information that can help us to answer that question? And then uh, lastly, the cultural evidence. Let's start with archaeological evidence. This here is a coin minted in Israel around the time of Yeshua. Can anybody read that? It's kind of hard to read, but anybody recognize the letters there? It's Yod, Resh, Vav, Shin, Lamed, Mem. Yerushalayim. Right, that's very good. That script is in the what I call the late Hebrew script or, or Aramaic square script. It's Aramaic letters. We talked a lot about that before. It is a coin minted around the time of Yeshua, which is around, we'll say, 30 A.D. And what, he, what language is it written in? Hebrew, not Greek, Hebrew. So we have some, a, a small amount of evidence of that. Here's another coin that was minted around the same time. I used this picture in another slide in another presentation. You have the Shin, the Mem, and the Ayin. What's that spell? Shema. Very good. Now, interestingly, this one is not written in the Aramaic or in the late uh, Hebrew Aramaic script, but it's written in the the Paleolithic or Paleo Hebrew. It's the older form. This is really the Hebrew alphabet here. The Yerushalayim is written in Aramaic script, but this one's written in the ancient Hebrew pictographic script. Another, all of the coins minted in Israel during the time of Yeshua were all in Hebrew that were minted by the Jews. This is uh, a picture, just a simple picture of one of the Dead Sea Scroll fragments. Ninety percent of the fragments and scrolls found in the Dead Sea Caves are written in... Hebrew, not just the biblical scrolls, not, not the copies of Genesis and Exodus, etc., but daily scrolls on daily tasks, how to do certain things, cooking instructions, all these things. They're in Hebrew. Now, if you're, gonna be, if you're an American and you're here in America and you're going to write out some details of how you do your day, what, are you going to write it in Greek? No, you're going to write it in English, your mother tongue. And that's what they did at the Dead Sea. They were written in Hebrew. Now, there are 5% that are written in Aramaic and 5% that are written in Greek. So there is a small percentage of those two, but the vast majority are in Hebrew. This is a letter uh, written by Simon Bar Kokhba. He was the general of the Jewish army during the revolt of 135 A.D. We're talking 100 years after Yeshua. 
And this is some instructions to his lieutenants during the war. Uh, a couple of things interesting here. First of all, we found out through this that his name is not Simon Bar Kokhba. It's Shimon Ben Kosva. That's actually what his real name was. And it's in Hebrew, Ben Kosva. There's a word right here, Tashmayim. What's a colloquialism? You familiar with the term colloquialism? He isn't here. We do not say he is not here. We say he isn't here. That's a colloquialism. Taking words and kind of cramming them together to make them smaller because we want to get our words out really, really fast. All languages have colloquialism. However, a, a colloquialism can only occur in a living language. The reason I bring this up is, is, is this is Hebrew. This is Hebrew. Some people could propose that, yes, he was writing in Hebrew as code because nobody knew Hebrew anymore, uh, so he was writing in code to his lieutenants. Well, no, that's not true, because he uses a colloquialism here. You can't do that in a language that's not spoken. The, the colloquialism is tashmayim, which is if you wanted to say, like, for example, in Genesis 1.1, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemayim. The et identifies the direct object of verb. The direct object is hashemayim, the, the, the sky or the heavens. So you would say et ha shemayim. But a colloquialism that we found here is, is that they took the aleph and dropped it from the word et. They took the ha from ha shemayim and dropped it, crammed the t over to shemayim, and you got shemayim. It's a colloquialism, just like our words isn't or aren't. That proves that this was his language. It's not Aramaic. It's not Greek. It's Hebrew. Historical evidence. This is uh, just a, a, a rendi render, rendition of uh, Josephus. Okay, Josephus, he's an interesting character. He is a Jew. Uh, this is during the, the, uh, the revolt, or the first revolt, or 70 A.D., when the temple was destroyed. He was a Jew, and the story as I hear it, and I, I, I'm not saying that this is 100% correct, but this is the way that I hear it, is, is that uh, he saw that they were losing. So what do you do if, if your side's losing? You jump to the other side. So he slipped out in the middle of the night and went over to the Romans and said, Hey, guys, you know, I'm a Jew, but I can help you out a lot. Anyway, so that's how he survived all of this. And he wrote down a, a lot of history about the Jewish people. Here's one of the quotes from his writings. I have also taken a great deal of pains to obtain the learning of the Greeks and understanding the elements of the Greek language. Although I have so long accustomed myself to speak our own language that I cannot pronounce Greek with sufficient exact exactness. For our nation does not encourage those that learn the languages of many nations. What Josephus is saying here is that the Jews do not learn other languages. The book of Maccabees is another historical evidence to show the Jewish or Judaism's view of the Greek people. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, the story of the Maccabees is the Greeks came in, took Jerusalem, and they basically said, we're going to kill you if you don't follow our way of thinking and worship our gods and stuff like that. So what do the Jews do? Some of them say, okay, and they join them and they start following Greek ways. Other Jews, the ones who were devout to the Torah, said, no, we will not. And not only did they say, no, we're not going to follow the Greek ways, they went in and killed the Jews who did follow the Greek way. This was how serious they were about the Greek culture. They did not want anything to do with it. These are just some, some of the many, many quotes from the church fathers. Papias says, Matthew composed the words in the Hebrew dialect and each translated as he was able. Origen says the first gospel is written according to Matthew, 
the same that was once a tax collector, but afterwards an apostle of Jesus Christ, who having published it for the Jewish believers, wrote it in Hebrew. Jerome says, Matthew, who is also a Levi and from a tax collector, came to be an apostle. First of all, evangelists composed a gospel of Christ in Judea in the Hebrew language and letters for the benefit of those of the circumcision who had believed who translated it into Greek is not sufficiently ascertained. To sum up the matter briefly, he, that's Clement of Alexandria, has given us abridged accounts of all the canonical scriptures. The epistle to the Hebrews, he asserts, was written by Paul to the Hebrews in the Hebrew tongue, but that it was carefully translated by Luke and published among the Greeks. This is about the book of Hebrews. Eusebius, for as Paul had addressed the Hebrews in the language of his country. What country is he from? Israel. What language does Israel speak? Hebrew. So Paul, according to Eusebius, was speaking in Hebrew Some say that the evangelist Luke, others that Clement translated the epistle, one of Paul's letters. So here we're seeing that Paul's letters were originally written in Hebrew. The point of all of these things is to show that, you know, here we are 2,000 years after that time, and we're trying to say what the New Testament was originally written in. Let's go back 1,800 years. What did they say? They're only 200 years removed. What did they say? Overwhelmingly, Matthew was originally written in Hebrew. There is no question about that. There's enough evidence to suggest, not just suggest, but to confirm that Matthew was originally in Hebrew. There is also evidence that Paul's letters and the book of Hebrews were originally written in Hebrew. Let's step back a second and go back 100 years. Let's say it's the year 1908. And you're a Bible scholar and you want to study the, the original scripts of the Bible, of the Old Testament. So what do you do? You go to the Sinai Codex, and this is a 300 to 400 A.D. copy of the Old Testament in Greek. Actually, it's the Old Testament and New Testament in Greek. The whole Bible. The Bible you got in Greek from about 300 to 400 A.D. This one is the Codex Vaticanus, the Vatican Codex. And this is pretty much around the same time period. It is the entire Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, in Greek. This is 16, at least 1,600 years old. Now you might ask, well, what about the Hebrew of the Old Testament? This was 1908. We're in 1908, remember? This is the oldest Hebrew Bible we have of the Old Testament. And this is the Aleppo Codex. It's a thousand years. Actually, it's only 900 years old. Okay, remember 1908, this was written around 1000 A.D. It's only 900 years old. And that's the only Hebrew we have of the Old Testament. Which is older? The Greek is older by, by about 800 years, 700 years. This is the Leningrad Codex. It's another Hebrew manuscript of the Old Testament, the Tanakh. And it's also only about 900 years old. This is a Greek fragment of the, Hebrew, the Old Testament. It's in Greek. And it's done around 100 B.C., somewhere around there. But it's in Greek. So this, this is the oldest, oldest piece that we have of the Old Testament. And it's in what? Greek. And we do have some old, old fragments. This is the uh, Nash papyrus found in Egypt. It has the Ten Commandments on it. It's in Hebrew, written around 200 B.C. The point of these pictures of what I'm trying to point out here is is that 100 years ago, the overwhelming evidence was that the Old Testament was written in Greek. Right? The oldest we have of the whole Bible is in Greek. We have ancient 200 B.C. Greek fragments. We do have a couple, not many, Hebrew. So it, it, it makes sense that the Old Testament was originally written in Greek, and then it was, you know, pieces were translated into Hebrew later. Did anybody propose that at all? Did anybody ever say that the Old Testament was originally written in Greek? Never. Nobody even hinted at the Old Testament. Why? It wasn't their language. These are Jews. This is Israel. What's their language? They must have written it in Hebrew. And there is only one place in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that really says that they did speak. Uh, This is 2 Kings 18.26. And Eliakim ben Chilkiyahu 
And Shevna and Yoah said to Rav Shakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramit, Aramaic, because we are listening and do not speak Yehudit, Jew, Jewish language, Yehudit, in the ears of the people which are upon the wall. In other words, these people are speaking either Aramaic, but the Israelites here are speaking in Jewish language. Now, we call it Hebrew, Ivrit, but that word is not, does not appear anywhere in the Bible anywhere. Evidently, it wasn't called Ivrit, it was called Yehudit from the tribe of what? Judah. We can assume that the Old Testament, the Tanakh, was originally written in Hebrew because they were Jews. They spoke the Jewish language. It just makes sense. Even though the oldest manuscripts we have are in Greek, right? Remember, we're in 1908. Let's move forward a few years to 1947. What did they find? The Dead Sea Scrolls. Now we have 2,000-year-old Hebrew manuscripts of the Bible, of the Tanakh. And there's our evidence that shows, of course, it was originally written in Hebrew, and now we have it, and we can show you 2,000-year-old copies of it. Now, let's, let, let's go to the New Testament. Remember we talked about the Sinai Codex? Okay. And we also talked about the uh, Vatican Codex. These are 300 to 400 A.D., copies of the Greek Old Testament and New Testament, Greek. This is a Greek fragment from the 2nd century A.D. This is one of the oldest Greek fragments of the New Testament. It comes from the book of John. And this is an Aramaic Peshitta. This is the, the Aramaic New Testament. It's a New Testament in Aramaic. I'm not really sure on its age. It's probably around 400 A.D. So now with this evidence, we can say that what people are saying is the oldest manuscripts we have are in Greek. So therefore, the New Testament had to have been written in Greek. That's the same argument I was trying to make with the Old Testament. Nobody proposed that idea. But what they're ignoring is the fact that where was the New Testament written? In Israel. They were Greeks, right? No, no, they weren't Greeks. They were what? Hebrews. What was the language of the first century? Hebrew, we saw some archaeological evidence where Hebrew from the Bar Kokhba letter in 135, have you ever heard the Hebrew language died out long before they came back into Israel from Babylon? You ever heard that? that? If that was true, how are they writing Hebrew in the Dead Sea Scrolls? How are they printing Hebrew coins with Hebrew on them? How are they, how is Simon Bar Kokhba, a hundred years after Yeshua, writing a letter in Hebrew if the Hebrew language had died and nobody knew it? It doesn't make sense. It's not lining up. I mentioned earlier that Matthew, overwhelming evidence, proves that it was originally written in Hebrew. How many of you have heard, the, heard about the Shem Tov Matthew? Yeah, about half. There's a lot of controversy over this. I'm not going to go into the controversy. I will mention a couple of things about the Shem Tov Matthew. Uh, its history is, is that uh, there was a rabbi in uh, Spain who had a Jewish community during the Spanish Inquisition. The bishops of the Catholic Church, or the Catholic Church would send a bishop to a Jewish community and debate their rabbi. The bishop would come and he would debate the rabbi. If the bishop wins the debate, all the Jews have to convert to Catholicism. If the rabbi wins, Jews are okay, they can continue on what they're doing, but the rabbi has to leave town. bishop would come and he would debate the rabbi. If the bishop wins the debate, all the Jews have to convert to Catholicism. If the rabbi wins, Jews are okay, they can continue on what they're doing, but the rabbi has to leave town. Anyway, so he decided, I'm going to win this debate. I would just assume leave, but let, I don't want my forced conversion on my flock. So he wants to win this debate, so he prepares ahead of time. And he writes what's called the Evan Bohan, the touchstone. And he writes an entire treatise. And you know what the bottom line of what he's trying to say is? You, in the Catholic Church, are teaching one thing, but your Bible says that you should be doing Torah. 
To prove his point, he attaches as an attachment a copy of the book of Matthew in Hebrew. Now, where did he get it? Where did he get this Hebrew Matthew? That's the question. That's the debate. Okay, some have proposed he did, he made it. He, he made a uh, Hebrew translation of of the Greek himself. Sorry, folks, that's impossible because in his text he talks about how bad the Hebrew grammar is in that text. He's recognized that there's problems with his Hebrew text grammatically, so he's recognized he would not do that if he wrote it himself. So no, he did not write it. Where did it come from? Could it be a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of original Matthew? Is it possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is not the only one. There are 27 other Hebrew Matthew copies scattered around the world in museums. The Dutelet, the Munster, and there's others. They're all different. They're all different. They have variations. We're going to look at a couple examples from the Shem Tov. The point of this is not to say you need to go out and get this Hebrew Matthew and live, live it and breathe it, because there are errors in it. There is some interjections from the rabbis, because some of the words that are in this are biblical Hebrew words from the Old Testament, but some of them are also rabbinic words that come from the Middle Ages. So we know that it's not the original. The point is, is that it's probably a copy of a copy of a You remember the old Xerox machines? They don't do it so much anymore, but, well, I guess they kind of do. You take a, a perfect, pristine uh, copy of something, you put it in the scanner, and you make a copy. Then you come back and you make a copy of the copy of the copy of the copy. What does it look like? Yeah, you hardly read it. It's that bad. Well, that's what happens when you copy these texts like that. That's why the Shem Tov's got the problems that it does. Let's take a look at uh, a couple of examples from the Shem Tov. Okay, first of all, in Numbers 30, verse 2, 3 in the Christian Bibles, a man that vows a bow to Yahweh or swears a swearing to bind a binding upon himself, he will not profane his words. All that goes out from his mouth he will do. Is it okay to swear? Absolutely. In fact, there are other passages that actually command it in the Torah. And, and the Torah says that if you're going to swear, you better follow through with it. Pretty simple. Here is what Yeshua said according to the Greek text. Matthew 5:33 to 35. Again, you have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform the, to the Lord what you have sworn. He's basically quoting what I just read you, right? Then he continues and says, again, you have heard that it was said of men of old, you shall not swear falsely, but perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Guess what, folks? According to the Greek text, Yeshua changed Torah. Have you ever heard that before? Why? Because of verses like this, and there's others. There, according to the Greek text, there are verses where Yeshua changed the Torah. What do we do with this? Let's go to the Shem Tov Matthew, and this is what it says. Again, you have heard what was said to the ones of old. You shall not swear in my name falsely, but you shall return to Yahweh what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not swear in vain in any matter, whether it is by heaven, which is the throne of Elohim, not in earth, which is his footstool, not in Jerusalem, which is the city of Elohim. You see, the practice in that day was that the, the Pharisees were saying, if I swear to the name of Yahweh, I have to do that, because that's what the Torah says. But if I swear to anything else, heaven, earth, it's okay if I don't follow through. That was what they were doing. Yeshua is condemning that practice. Matthew 23, 1-3, Then said Jesus to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on the seat of Moses. So practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do, but do not practice. That is a contradiction in itself. The problem here, and, and I had a lot of struggle with this issue myself years ago when I came into the Messianic movement. I followed the rabbis. I followed the teachings of the rabbis, and then I came to the teaching of the rabbis that says, don't believe in Yeshua. So now Yeshua is telling me to do what the rabbis say. The rabbis say, don't follow Yeshua. i got a problem here. 
I did not know how to answer this question. I did not know how to resolve this dilemma until I saw the Shem Tov. This is what it says in the Shem Tov. That, by the way, what I said was Greek. It Actually, it's just one word that's the issue, and it's they said. Do what they said. That's the issue. In Hebrew, in the, well, actually, the Hebrew word for they said is yomru. Yomru. The u there is plural. It's they said. Is that in the Shem Tov, Matthew? No. What's in there is yomer. He said, singular. Do what he said. Then Yeshua spoke to the people and to his Talmudim. See, that's what I love about the Shem Tov, too. It doesn't use disciple. Or the Greek word. I I don't know Greek well. I don't like Greek. But it uses the word Talmudim in there. It uses the word Talmudim. Saying, upon upon the seat of Moshe, the Pedershim, the Pharisees, and the Chachmim, the wise ones, sit. Therefore, all that he, he, who's he? Moshe. So who the seat belongs to. Do what he says. Forget about the Pharisees and and the uh, uh, wise ones. Do what Moshe said. But do not do there. Who's the there? The Pharisees and the Chachmim. They're Takanot and they're Ma'asim. Anybody familiar with those two terms? Yeah. Those are Talmudic terms for the traditions of the rabbis. Here In the Hebrew Matthew now, we're finding out that what he was actually saying was, don't concern yourself with the traditions of the rabbis, just do what Moshe said. All right, let's take a look at some textual evidence. This is actually evidence now inside of your Greek text, in your Greek text. And mind you, this is just scratching the surface. If you want to get into this, there are several books on it, on this subject that, that can help you to look at more of this evidence. Acts 21.37 as Paul was about, here's Paul, he's in, um, I believe it's Jerusalem, and there's some Roman guards there. And I believe he's just brought out of the prison and there's a crowd out there. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say so? the tribune, he's a, he's a Roman, probably either speaking Greek or Latin, and Paul says to him, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? What language was Paul speaking there? Greek. Was this Roman surprised? Why? Because he wasn't speaking Hebrew. Because everybody, all you people speak Hebrew. How did you learn Greek? He was surprised. Just a few verses later. And when he had given him leave, the, the tribune had given him leave, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. When there was a great hush, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language. That's in your Greek text. Paul was speaking in Hebrew. How many of you have the NIV? Paul was speaking in Hebrew. How many of you have the NIV? The NIV, when it says in the, in the Greek, Hebraisti, they translate that as Aramaic. So the NIV and some other translations I don't remember, they take that Greek word Hebraisti and translate it into Aramaic. Now the Greek word for Aramaic is Syristi, Syria. Aramaic and Syria are one and the same thing. They're tr- that's a bad translation if you ever see Aramaic in there because the Greek word is Hebraisti, which is Hebrew. That's in the Greek text. He was speaking Hebrew. John 19, 19 to 20. Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross. Remember the, that sign that was put up up there? It read, Yeshua, or Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. What happened to Aramaic? There's no Aramaic there. Why? Because that's not the language they were speaking. You wanted to make sure that the Romans and the Greeks read it and the Jews read it. 
That's all you were concerned with when they put that sign up there. So Aramaic was not, according to this verse, was not the language that the Jews were speaking at that time. Matthew 3, 9. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. For those of you that have been learning Hebraic thought, Hebraic writings, and maybe learn a little bit of Hebrew, you've come across this idea of Hebrew poetry, Hebrew puns, parallelisms. These are common throughout the Tanakh. They're all over the place. The Hebrew likes to make word puns. For example, we would say, the artist painted the canvas. We would not say, the painter painted the painting. You don't hear us talk like that, do you? You know, we try and avoid those type of, of, of sentences, but not Hebrew. Hebrew would continue it. The painter painted the painting. That's the, they love those word plays. They do it all the time. You find them throughout the Tanakh. Guess what if you take the Hebrew New Testament and translate it into Hebrew? Guess what you find? Word puns everywhere in the text. They're all over the place. This is one of them, one of many of them. Can't see it in the English. You can't see it in the, he- in the Greek, only in the Hebrew. The Hebrew for the word stone is eben, or eben, in the plural ebenim, or ebenim, that's stones. Children in Hebrew is benim. You hear that? Ebenim, benim. He's just simply doing a word pun here. That, that's just the way they talk. This is, is just one small evidence that, that this was originally spoken in Hebrew. Matthew 15:35 to 37 And commanding the crowd to sit down on the ground he took the seven loaves of the fish and having given thanks he broke them and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and they all ate and were satisfied Here here I'm going to read this again but I'm going to replace it with Hebrew translations from the Greek see if you can hear it And commanding the crowd to yashav on the esev he took the shava loaves and the fish and having given thanks he shabbat them and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and they all ate and were sabah and shabbat seven sayas can you hear that how many i mean my gosh that's not coincidence these words were originally written in hebrew because we can see all of these puns there mark 3 9 and he said the kingdom of god is as if a man should scatter seed upon the ground and he said, the kingdom of God is as if an atom should zarah scatter, zarah seed upon the Adama. Here we have zarah and zarah. Zarah is the verb meaning to scatter. Zera is the word for seed. Again, another pun popping up out of the... Oh, and also Adam is man, Adama is ground. They're all over the place in there. Two things to recognize here. First of all, this is from the book of Mark. Secondly, it uses the phrase kingdom of God, Malkut Elohim. Is this talking about the kingdom of who, which belongs to God, Elohim? Would you agree with that? That this is the kingdom that belongs to God? Yes or no? By the way, this one isn't a trick question. For those that have been here the last two days, see, that's why everybody's so hesitant here. <laughs> They're like, you're not going to trap me on that one. <laughs> Okay, that one wasn't a trick question. <laughs> yes, it's talking about God's kingdom. It belongs to him. It's his. But let's take it. This is the beginning of a parable. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed upon the ground. This is one of his parables. This very same parable is found in the book of Matthew. In Matthew it says, Another parable set he before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven, Malkut HaShemayim, is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. In Luke, the same verse reads, He said, therefore, unto what is the kingdom of God like? And whereunto shall I liken it? It is also like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast into his own garden. It's the same parable, one parable, but recorded by two individuals. However, the difference is, is that Matthew records it as the kingdom of heaven, whereas Mark, or Luke, is recording it as the kingdom of God. Why the difference? Because for one thing, we know that Matthew was written to the Hebrews, to the Jewish people. And in Judaism, do you say Elohim? Yes, you do. But let's go back 2,000 years. They did not. Just like the name Yahweh. Do Jews pronounce the name Yahweh? 
No, what do they say instead? Hashem. They did the same thing with Elohim. They would not say Elohim. They would use a euphemism. Adonai is a euphemism of the name Yahweh. One of the euphemisms used in the first century by the Jews is the word Shemayim, heaven. So Mark, or Luke, excuse me, is probably giving his letter to people who don't really understand Hebraic thought very well. So he has to take what Yeshua said, because Yeshua was speaking in a Hebrew, he, he said, kingdom of heaven. He used the euphemism. But Mark, knowing that his readers aren't going to understand that, he translates the euphemism into what he meant, the kingdom of God. So how many of you heard that the kingdom of heaven is a place? It's not. It's the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of a person, not a place. But the point here is, is that Luke, in the Greek text, we see that he is writing possibly, or maybe originally in Greek, although I doubt it, but it's possible. But he's reading to people who aren't familiar with Hebraic thought. But Matthew is definitely writing to Hebrew people in Hebrew. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We were just talking about this earlier out in the hall there. Uh, no one comes to the Father but by me. What to recognize here is this is what's called a parallelism. We don't recognize them because we don't know what they are. Well, let me tell you what they are because you're going to start seeing them now everywhere. Believe me. Once you understand the concept of a parallelism, you're going, oh, that's a parallelism because they're everywhere in the Bible. A parallelism is simply saying one thing two different ways. The road is long and the way is far. Okay, that's common in the Hebrew Bible of hearing things like that. The lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. It's a parallelism. There's also opposites. The, and I used an example in one of my other slides before, is, uh, the other day, is the righteous do this and the wicked do that. Okay, this is an opposite parallelism, making opposites. These are everywhere in the Tanakh, from Genesis all the way to uh, Second Chronicles. And guess what? They're all over the New Testament too. The New Testament in one place says that all of it, his disciples and the multitude came to him. Now, the way we interpret that is, is that his 12 disciples came to him and also a big crowd of people. That's not what it means because of the Hebrew parallelism there. It's saying there was a whole crowd of disciples, a whole multitude of disciples. But we miss that because we don't understand Hebrew poetry. This here, I am the way, the truth, and the life, is a Hebrew parallelism. It's saying one thing three different ways. It's also common to, to triple it, to say the same thing. All of these are synonyms in Hebraic thought. They mean the same concepts, so. This, here we have Matthew 424. So his fame, his is Yeshua, spread throughout all of Syria. And they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. Did Yeshua go to Syria? No, he never. He stayed in the land of Israel. The problem is, is that this is a Greek translation of a Hebrew. And if you translate from one language to another, sometimes you make a mistake. Hebrew word for Syria, as I mentioned earlier, is Aram. Aramean is, is, is one from Aram, Aramaic. Aram is the Hebrew word for Syria. So the, the, the translator is looking at this, this Hebrew text, and he sees the word Aram and writes it, translated it into Greek as Syria. But what if the Hebrew was actually this word, Am? Anybody know what Am means? People. I and Mem. It means people. He reads it as Am, but he's thinking Aram, and he writes Syria. Let's plug that in and see if it fits. So his fame spread throughout all the people. Now that makes sense to me. So what, what this is pointing out here is, is that there are errors in the New Testament that are translational errors from the Hebrew. Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Greek word for poor is patokos. Patokos means poor. It means beggarly, 
destitute, lacking in needs. Does that sound like somebody that's in the Spirit? Somebody who's lacking the Spirit is going to inherit the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God? That don't make no sense to me. But let's take this word, Greek word patokos, let's say maybe the translator, you know, uh, well, this is actually the way you would translate it. And the Hebrew word for poor is ani. It's the same thing. Ani in Hebrew, patokos in Greek, they basically mean the same thing. So that would be a Greek translation of the Hebrew. However, the Hebrew word ani can also mean, anybody know? No, no, that's that spell, that's a different spelling. Aleph nun yod. This is ayin nun yod. Means humble. Not in the Greek. Patokos doesn't mean humble. But the Hebrew word does. So, if this was originally written in Greek, if you don't have any spirit, you're going to get the kingdom. <laughs> However, if you look at it from the Hebrew text, a Hebrew, it would say, blessed are the humble in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Does that change the text? from the way we're reading. Does this prove that it was originally written in Hebrew? I think so. Have you ever heard that, uh, that there are Aramaic words in the New Testament, therefore maybe it was originally written in Aramaic? Have you ever heard that there are Hebrew words in the New Testament? A few. Interestingly, we hear a lot. Now, go back 50 years. Most people believe that the New Testament was written in Greek. But now... People are shifting. They're, they're getting educated. They're understanding. And now they're saying it was originally written in Aramaic and then translated into Greek. A lot of scholars are starting to say that. Uh, I still don't, I'm not quite in agreement with them. But they're saying that one of the evidences of this is there's a lot of Aramaic words in the New Testament. You know what? There are. But you know what? There's a whole lot more Hebrew words in the New Testament. Here's some examples of Hebrew words that are translated in the Greek and your English Bibles. You'll recognize all of these. Hallelujah. That's a Hebrew word. Amen. That's Hebrew. Korban. Y'all heard that word? Yeshua was talking about the Pharisees. They're, they're, they're offering their korban. That's a Hebrew word. It's found in the Tanakh. Rabbi. The rabbi. What does rabbi mean? More than just teacher. My teacher. Rav means teacher. Great one, literally. Great one. Somebody said that over there. But if you want to say my something, like hand is yad, here a little Hebrew lesson for you. This will show you how simple Hebrew is. It's really not a difficult language. Yad. Everybody say that. Yad. Very good. My hand. Yadi. You put an E at the end of it. Yadi. His hand. Yado. There you go. Your first Hebrew lesson. My hand is yadi. If I want to say my great one, my teacher, it would be rabbi. Rabbi, which we say rabbi. Raka. Yeshua said in Matthew 5 that if you even call your brother Raka, that's a Hebrew word over here on the right-hand side. Let's take a look at that. Raka, there it is in Greek. As you find in the Greek text, it's Strong's number 4869. But if you go to the Tanakh, you'll find the word rek, and it's 7386, and it, it means wicked. All of these words are Hebrew words. They're found in your Greek text, and they're also found in your English text. They transliterate them from Hebrew to Greek to English. Sabaton, Satan, Saba, Sabaot in Greek, it's sa, Sabaot in Hebrew. It means literally armies. Yahweh Sabaot, that's Yahweh of the armies. Hosanna, Hosanna in the Greek, but it's Hoshiana in the Hebrew. These are all Hebrew words in the New Testament they were translated into Greek, and then also your translators transliterated. Everybody understand the difference between translation and transliteration? Translation is taking a word from one language and translating it into a word meaning the same thing in another language. Transliterating is taking a word in one language and using the script of another language to write that same sounding word. Does that make sense? All right, these are transliterated words. Now, these are Hebrew words that are translated into the Greek, but the translators translate them. Okay? In other words, the first example there, in the Greek text, you'll see the word seis. Okay? You see it over there on the left-hand side. It's Strong's number 4597. In the Greek text, it says seis. In your English translation, they will take that and translate it as moth. That's what seis means. But seis is not a Greek word. It's a Hebrew word. And it is Hebrew Strong's number 5580. 
You can go to find that in the Old Testament. You'll see the word sis, and you'll see the Hebrew word there. So here we have, and there's a, this is just a small portion of them, of Hebrew words that the, the Greek writer is transliterating into Greek characters. Why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? Why doesn't he just use a Greek word? It probably isn't one to convey the exact idea. We do it all the time, don't we? Shalom! Bokatov! We, we, we are using the Hebrew language in our conversations. We don't say la. You know, what do we say? We say Torah. We use the Hebrew word. Why? Because la does not convey the, the Hebrew concept of Torah. Pledge is in Greek, apabon, but in, in Hebrew, or excuse me, arabon. In Hebrew, it's a, it's a Hebrew word, arabon. This happens a time after time after time. Measure, fine linen, sackcloth. Your English translations are translating, so you can't see them. But these are Hebrew words. They're littered throughout the New Testament. Okay, cultural evidence. Matthew 9, 20. And behold, a woman who had an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the border of his garment. Your translations will say the border or the hem of his garment. Why was this woman coming up to touch the hem of his garment? Well, first of all, the Greek word for border is kraspadon. But if you look in the Septuagint, the 2,000-year-old Greek translation, it's the Hebrew word tzitzit. Okay? She was going to grab his tzitzit. Why? Because Malachi 4.2 says that the, when, he, when the Son of Righteousness comes, he will come with a healing in his wings. Wings is kanaf, which can mean wings or corners of a four-cornered garment. So when the Messiah comes, he's going to come with healing in his tzitzit. She was issuing blood. She's been sick for 12 years. What does she do? She runs to him to grab his tzitzit. We have to recognize that these people are Jewish people. The New Testament was written by Jews, for Jews, about Jews. Why would they use Greek? Why would they use Aramaic? Matthew 5, 17 says, I have not come to destroy the law, but I have come to destroy the law. That's the way most people interpret that. It says I have come to fulfill. In other words, I'm going to do it. You don't have to. Therefore, I'm destroying it. That's what way most people interpret this. But he does, it's not what he says. I have, come to I have not come to destroy it, but to fulfill. What does fulfill mean? To complete, amplify. Okay, I'm hearing a lot of different words. It's really simple, folks. I have a dictionary, it's a Jewish dictionary, that goes into phrases, the Talmudic phrases and, and, and concepts and things like that. And guess what? Those words are in there, to destroy and to fulfill. They're rabbinic terms. To destroy means to give a false interpretation. To fulfill means to give a proper interpretation. If two rabbis are having a debate, and one rabbi gives an interpretation of Torah, and the other one doesn't like it, he disagrees, he thinks that's wrong, he says, you are destroying the Torah! However, if the rabbi was giving a correct interpretation and he agreed with him, he said, you have fulfilled the Torah. And this is what Yeshua, he was a, a rabbi, wasn't he? So this is what he was trying to convey to them. What does Yeshua go into after this discussion? He says, anyone who goes and teaches others to not do the Torah is considered least in the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes in and he says, you have heard it said this. In other words, you've heard the Torah interpreted this way. That's destroying the Torah because now I'm going to fulfill it for you and this is how you should read it. Read, read that Matthew 5 in that context sometime when you get home. Take out your Bible. Read Matthew 5:17 to the end of the chapter. James 2:10. I like this one. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has been guilty of it all. You know what? You blew it once. Forget it. You're done. You're guilty of the whole thing. Why even bother with it? How many of you have heard that before? Oh, almost everybody. Uh, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it, so why even bother? You're already guilty. One of the problems is, is people don't understand Jewish midrash. Midrash 
it comes from the root derash, which means to seek, to search out something. And in rabbinic and in Jewish teachings and in studies, when we do midrashes, you make certain claims drawing upon the text. I'm going to give you a similar example from, from Jewish thought, a similar example to this. If you destroy one life, you have destroyed a universe. That makes sense. Because one individual, his offspring, can populate a world. We saw that with Noah, didn't we? So the, the Jews say that if you destroy it, what, what's, what's the purpose of that saying? What is the purpose of that? Sanctity of human life. How important human life is. Don't even take one life because if you do, you destroy a world. The same thing is being said by Yaakov here 2,000 years ago. He's saying, if you... Who, for whoever keeps the whole law. Now remember what I said earlier the other day about keeping doesn't mean necessarily obedience, but to guard and to protect it, but fails in one point, he breaks it. Okay? In other words, not just he, he disobeys it, he takes it on the ground and throws it and tramples all over it. He is guilty of all. If you take one command and throw it away, you've done it to the entire thing. How many of us here throw any of the commandments away? How many of us um, obey them 100%? Anybody? I don't see any hands. Nobody? Okay. All right. No. We are not. We have our problems. We make mistakes, and God knows that. What Yaakov is saying here is he's talking about a hard attitude toward the issue. It's not just if you break one, therefore it's worthless. Okay? That's not what he's saying. It's a Jewish midrash. It's, it's trying to understand what the Torah is. Conclusions. This is from Wikipedia. And this is a quote that I found in there. I was really surprised to see it in there. But I was told this exact same thing by a Hebrew scholar from Israel uh, ten years ago. The exact same thing, what we're going to read here. By the early half of the 20th century, modern scholars reached a nearly unanimous opinion that Aramaic became a spoken language in the land of Israel. By the start of Israel's Hellenistic period in the 4th century BCE, that's... 400 years, 300 to 400 years before Yeshua. And thus, Hebrew ceased to function as a spoken language around the same time. However, during the latter half of the 20th century, accumulating archaeological evidence and especially linguistic analysis of the Dead Sea Scrolls has qualified the previous consensus. Alongside Aramaic, Hebrew also flourished as a living spoken language. Hebrew flourished until near the end of the Roman period when it continued on as a literary language by the Byzantine period in the 4th century CE. Although the survival of Hebrew as a spoken language until the Byzantine period is well known among Hebrew linguists, there remains a lag in awareness among some historians who do not necessarily keep up to speed with linguistic research and rely on outdated scholarship. Nevertheless, the vigor of Hebrew is slowly but surely making its way through the academic literature. The Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church that once said in 1958 in its first edition, Hebrew ceased to be a spoken language around the 4th century B.C. Now says in 1997 in its third edition, it says, Hebrew continued to be used as a spoken and written language in the New Testament period. You see, in archaeology, and this scholar that I'm talking about, his name is Dr. William Bean, excellent, excellent scholar, learned a lot from him. He said, and he works in Israel, he's worked with the Dead Sea Scrolls, works in Jerusalem with a lot of the scholars there. He said that it takes 50 years for what becomes known in Israel to reach here in America. 50 years. That's how long it takes for our scholars here in America to catch up to what's being learned in Israel. Here we have a picture of Yeshua, Jesus. Yesterday I put up the picture about the Last Supper. By the way, I want to mention something about that. I've had some discussions with people afterwards. I had an excellent discussion with somebody after that who was trying to tell me that he believed, or he was explaining how, why he believes that was not the Last Supper but another meal. I respect that. He and I disagree. A lot of you and I disagree on issues. That's okay. And it fosters discussion. We had a little debate going on about it. And it was fun. 
There's nothing wrong with that. We can have differences of opinions, but let's have fun with it. You know, the rabbis used to say, if you're studying Torah and you're not laughing, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> got to be laughing. you got to have a good time when you're doing it. We may disagree on the Last Supper of when it was, but that's okay. I don't expect everybody in here to believe every word I say. And also I wanted to add out of my last two teachings that I did, if you disagree with something, great, go find out why. Come and tell me. Maybe you know something I don't. But what I do not like is a person saying, I don't believe that. Why? Because I don't. No evidence. No looking into it. it just, flat out, it just doesn't agree with my theology is what he's saying. He's interpreting the Bible according to his theology. Anyway, this picture here is what we all grew up with. But this is not the Yeshua. Like I did with the Last Supper, there are things that are missing in there. There's no talit. He's wearing Greek clothing. What you have been taught, what we have all been taught, is really what we've been taught is that Jesus is a Greek philosopher wearing Greek clothes, teaching Greek philosophy in the Greek language. That is what we have been taught. But he is a Jew who's speaking the Hebrew language, teaching Hebraic thought from the Tanakh. That is who he is. He's a rabbi. He would be wearing tallit. But we don't, never learned those images of him. Aside from the issue of what language the New Testament was originally written, the primary question should be, what language did Yeshua and his Talmudim speak when teaching? If they taught in Hebrew, then... We must understand his teachings from a Hebraic perspective, not through the Greek. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. I had a lot of fun.